I'm Tom Brokaw, NBC News, New York. The American Embassy in Lebanon at lunchtime in Beirut today. A huge bomb destroyed most of the building. 39 people were killed, including at least five Americans. On April 18, 1983, the early afternoon calm is shattered by a suicide car bombing at the U.S. Embassy in Beirut. The deadliest attack on a U.S. diplomatic mission up to that time, the event is a catalyst and a turning point. U.S. diplomatic security would be thrust into a modern era of new enemies, evolving threats, and an entirely new set of obstacles to diplomacy. World War I and the threat of spying present concerns beyond the capabilities of the diplomatic status quo. Rising to that challenge, President Woodrow Wilson details Secret Service agents to the State Department. Then, on April 4, 1916, Secretary of State Robert Lansing, recognizing that wartime needs are above and beyond the scope and mission of the Secret Service, creates the first State Department security office, the Secret Intelligence Bureau. When uh, uh, Secretary of State Lansing uh, realized that he needed someone to help secure uh, our uh, equities uh, in the Foreign Service and the State Department and to be a part of uh, what was our responsibility in ensuring that foreign diplomats were appropriately protected, he enlisted the assistance of Bill Nye. Mr. Nye was our first Chief Special Agent in uh, 1916. His primary duty was to ensure that German diplomats were watched. With the end of the global conflict in November of 1918, the United States finds itself, for the first time in its history, a major player on the world stage. For its part, the State Department recognizes the responsibilities of its new role as an international leader and commits to do more to protect its communications, its diplomats, and its obligation to the pursuit of post-war diplomacy. Within 20 years, the world is once again engulfed by the flames of conflict. During World War II, State Department security serves the Allied effort and the beginning of what is hoped to be a collaborative post-war world. An expanded Office of Security is established, as is a formal partnership with the Marine Corps for embassy security guards, and diplomatic security officers are now posted on embassy staffs. We became more focused on the domestic side, our background investigations. Uh, you know, there were a number of incidents where we were called to the hill, in fact, because of our uh, vetting of uh, some very important Department of State uh, personalities. We were in conflict with the White House at some points during that time period as well. And so we were developing our investigative talents. From the outset of diplomatic relations in 1933, Soviet surveillance of the U.S. Moscow Embassy is constant, but a September 1952 security sweep reveals a breach at the highest level. The Soviet Union had given the ambassador to, uh, from the U.S. a gift of a great seal. It was a really nice wood carving that he put in his office in his residence. Over time, though, there were members of the uh, uh, embassy who began to realize that Wow, the Soviet Union uh, uh, ministers that we're meeting with, uh, they know more than we do about the conversation we're going to have before we even get there. Ultimately, they were able to find that it was the Great Seal that was transmitting the conversations back. It took a bit because we not only had to find the threat, we also had to let the KGB not know that we were looking for it. We didn't want to give away the fact that we were aware something had changed. That's kind of the game that we play in our uh, countermeasures uh, programs. In the 1970s, terrorism is on the rise and increasingly directed at embassies. On November 4, 1979, Iranian student militants storm the U.S. Embassy and take more than 60 Americans hostage, with 52 held a total of 444 days. This includes the regional security officer, the assistant regional security officer, and nine marine security guards. On November 21, 1979, Pakistani students storm the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad and kill a marine security guard, Corporal Stephen J. Crowley. Historically, embassies have been viewed as safe havens, 
benefiting from the cooperation and the protection of the host country. Now, in less than three weeks, two countries, Iran and Pakistan, prove to be, at best, uncooperative with regard to protection. Then, on April 18, 1983, it was a terrible day in a city which has experienced so much tragedy. The American embassy in Beirut shattered by a huge bomb. After the bombings in uh, Beirut against the Marines and then also the embassy bombings, the Secretary of State impaneled a group of experts. The second bombing of our embassy in Beirut had repercussions that transcended the mere interests of the Department of State and the personnel of the department. The Congress and people of the United States were outraged. The Inman Commission, with Bobby Ray Inman as chairman, was thus born in uh, late 1984. The Inman panel calls for a broad range of security improvements, including increased setbacks between embassies and public streets, a major building program to improve security in existing embassies, and the building of new embassies to replace those that cannot meet the new standards. A direct result is the creation of the Bureau of Diplomatic Security and the Diplomatic Security Service within the U.S. State Department. The subtle art form of diplomatic security will never be the same. There were a number of us who were hired at the time, and we were called the Inman Babies. Diplomatic security was established, the Overseas Security Advisory Council was established, and I think it was really the birth of our organization as we know it today. Despite improving awareness and security at overseas embassies, terrorism strikes in East Africa. On August 7, 1998, two trucks laden with explosives enter the U.S. Embassy compounds in Nairobi, Kenya and Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. At 10.35 a.m. and 10.39 a.m. respectively, Al-Qaeda strikes its first blows, killing 224 people, including 12 Americans. When the East Africa bombings happened, and let's call this Al-Qaeda's coming out party, um, you know, posts in East Africa were considered low threat, as many posts around the world were in 1998. We had to come to terms with, yet again, where is the world going to, and how do we keep up with it? More importantly, how do we advance past that keeping up and grow capacity for the future? The Clinton administration commissions the Accountability Review Boards, chaired by Admiral William J. Crow to investigate the bombings and make recommendations on embassy security. It made everybody take a look at how do we determine what threats are and where they come from. We had to immediately look at our facilities. We had to say, we could be the next target. If I was a bad guy, where would I go? Right, what would I attack? The September 11, 2001 attacks begin an era of expeditionary diplomacy, requiring enhanced diplomatic security in increasingly hostile environments around the world. But diplomacy cannot be conducted from a bunker. For its part, the Bureau of Diplomatic Security does all it can to further secure the diplomatic missions in ways that do not inhibit diplomacy even if it means that diplomats themselves and their support staffs must still face always evolving risks during the conduct of their duties. We are always doing more with less because as we accept those additional responsibilities, we're always tasked with more responsibilities. And the world is ever more unsafe than it was the day before. As we look at the, the terrorist uh, uh, programs around the world that we're having to combat the last decade and a half since 9-11, it's been a constant sprint in a marathon race. And we've continued to grow our personnel to the point that we're at today, and I can speak specifically to the special agents as an example. With DS, we're in embassies in 275 some odd posts worldwide. Every country has a different atmospheric. Every country has a different challenge. But all countries, we are trying to establish diplomatic relations, and, and we want people to be free to go and engage and interact. And, and how do we permit them to do what needs to get done while protecting them against what we are afraid of? I, I think that's the, the challenge that we face. What I've always tried to emulate and try to teach agents, our job's not to say no. Our job is to say how to make it happen. 
it's really more of an art form than a science. Um, we have to we have to look at the situation. We have to adapt to the situation. In predicting things like conversation and negotiation, it's awfully tough to be heavy-handed and appear to be heavy-handed and think that that's going to end up successful. So we have to have it end safely and securely, but have it look as if it may be something else. It has to look normal. On December 18th, 2010, a wave of demonstrations, protests, riots, and civil wars sweeps across the Middle East. It will become known as the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring was uh, in Cairo, Egypt. I was the regional security officer. For the Arab Spring to hit when it did, January the 25th for us of 2011, it could not have happened for our, our embassy at a better time because we were prepared. We had been able to use the two and a half years before to exercise our programs, to ensure that we had our local guards up to the absolute best standard we could possibly bring them. What I had to do was establish new transportation routes to all of the Arab Spring affected cities, embassies and consulates, out of Frankfurt. So it involved finding new airlines, it involved finding new partners to work with, which is great when you have the time to do so, when you have time to make contacts and work through it all, figure out how you're going to do it. During the Arab Spring, we needed to get them the tools they needed on the ground immediately. And so we had to do this all right away, which is what made it so challenging. A couple days after the beginning of the, the revolution, Arab Spring in, in Egypt, um, I was sent out to the airport. So I was the only one in the regional security office that had an airport pass and had the airport contacts to find out which airlines were flying. We had arranged through our military contacts to get an air hangar that we could actually start having charter flights come in. So for the next week I was out at the airport assisting the chief of mission staff and their families getting out as well as private Americans getting on charter flights to, to get out of Egypt, to get out of the situation there. Our Marines were, were very well drilled. The My entire office was aware of their responsibilities. My uh, team was remarkable in the depth of knowledge that they had of their programs. It allowed us then to help defend the mission and then to orchestrate the evacuation of not only our family members, but close to 7,000 other U.S. American citizens. And so that was a, a culminating event personally as a, a regional security officer, but it also uh, showed to me the fragility of many of our missions overseas because it was actually a surprise to many of us, to most of us, to all of us, that the Arab Spring erupted as it did. And I think that's that's the balance we struggle to find in, in any security agency is, is how do you stay against something that you've never seen before? H how do you prepare for something that you've never seen before? Following lessons learned from the September 2012 attack on the American diplomatic compound in Benghazi, Libya, the Bureau of Diplomatic Security creates the new High Threat Programs Directorate to oversee security at the most critical high threat posts throughout the world. What that meant was those posts, which were now part of a new a directorate, the High Threat Programs, would get extra focus, much more um, uh, expeditious resources, whether it's personnel, funding, Whatever the case may be, we had to do things in a more um, expedient manner. What I like people to understand about DS is just how much we do. We're concerned about identity theft. We're concerned about um, tax fraud, misuse of social security benefits, all types of things that really get into complex cases. Any federal crime that's in, in tied to these and passport fraud, we do investigate. We've seen human trafficking and smuggling, which is a huge problem, especially of children and women. So the travel documents are, are very important for that, whether it be just to smuggle those people in so they can have a better life or, you know, they actually are a criminal element that's coming in to do the U.S. harm. One of our biggest challenges is to protect the integrity of a U.S. passport, a U.S. visa, U.S. travel documents. The U.S. passport is the most coveted travel document in the world. Same thing, too, with the U.S. visa. They're very important documents, and their integrity and protecting their integrity is, is very important and a big mission for DS.
we've come so far in, in the last 13, 14 years I've been here and, and the hundred years that it's taken to get to this point, we can just imagine with the cyber security threat, with more embassies and consulates going up worldwide, increasing diplomatic relations, we're now in places that traditionally we wouldn't have been or, or more dangerous than were previously. Diplomacy has become, and will remain for the foreseeable future, a dangerous career. But the focus must always be on protecting the diplomatic process first and foremost, a tenet upon which the diplomats, the staffers, and the Bureau of Diplomatic Security all agree. So as I look at our ability to influence uh, foreign policy as an enabler, we have uh, a tremendous organization that both develops information from across the spectrum, feeds that to the policymakers to tell them what the threats against us are. We do take our diplomats into Mogadishu. We do provide opportunities for our diplomats to see everyone across the spectrum of, of society in difficult places like Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Iraq. There's always a give and take between DS agents and foreign service officers who are the general diplomats of the State Department. The simple fact of the matter is we're out there to help them do their job. I do think there, that that give and take is healthy and I say that because it means that we're paying attention to their job and they're paying attention to our job too. We are diplomats and when we go abroad we don't have the luxury to demand what we think we need to create the environment we know we want. So we have to ask, beg, plead, negotiate, and, and use all of the diplomatic techniques that we develop and are taught uh, during the course of a career to accomplish those tasks. And this goes back to that delicate balance, that subtlety, that we have to ensure that we provide as safe and secure an environment as we can to operate, but we also have to be outside those walls of the embassy to experience the culture, to share our culture. We often think of our DS agents. There's also so much more, whether it's the security technical specialists and security engineering officers that take care of the technical security aspect or the diplomatic courier service. What is required to keep an embassy safe despite conditions on the ground, whatever they may be, is so varied. So what we do is so much more than you originally expect. One of the things I usually describe how we go about our, our, our business, and, and just about every day, is a delicate dance. And there's a saying in DS, we call it Simper Gumby. It's Simper Gumby. So it's keep it flexible. It's as, as the Marine Corps says, Simper Fi, we have to be a little bit more malleable than that. So that basically is, is how we go about almost every day that we, we spend in DS. If you're prepared, you're able to, to jump up and say, Coach, I'm ready, send me in, put me in the game. That's the message that I've tried to leave with uh, those in DS who will follow me as well, is it's not about uh, looking good today, it's about preparing for the mission tomorrow.